Can you program your own mind? The answer is yes. Today we're sitting down with Cameron Yarbrough, my former exec coach and founder of Torch.io. Torch is the best way you can get exec coaching and he's led me through some of the biggest breakthroughs I've had in my career. I do this YouTube channel because I want you to learn from my mistakes that I learned the hard way so you don't have to. Let's get started. Cameron, thank you so much for hanging out today, man. It's uh, always a pleasure to spend time with you. Thanks, Gary. I'm I'm super. I've been looking forward to this moment, and and really glad to be here. You know, we've both spent a lot of time sort of working on ourselves, and we've spent a lot of time with founders. One of the things we've talked about in the past is how common, really, trauma is as a common origin for so many startup founders. Um, it's not the only prime driver, but it's a very big one. And I think a lot of people prefer not to talk about it. Some of them who haven't actually ever dealt with anything very difficult in their lives, we would see it at YC every so often. And um, it would actually result in sort of instant failure. Uh, it's almost like their limbic system was sort of overwhelmed because they'd never dealt with such big loss or such big failure in their, in their you know, lives previously. And then on the flip side, some of the most successful founders both of us have worked with have actually seen a lot, have been through a lot. So, you know, a lot of strength can kind of come out of that. I started first noticing this pattern with founders back when I was a therapist. People who were running startups and coming into my practice were people who often came from family systems that were very, very tumultuous. It's not uncommon for founders to come from alcoholic family systems, systems where they had had a parent die family systems in which there was physical and verbal abuse. Very, very often I would see that founders had come from these very rocky pasts. And what was interesting to me was how much they were uniquely positioned to succeed in startup environment, because in some ways startups become this proxy environment that we can recreate that traumatic kind of family experience, which is very alluring. But also I noticed that it became a proxy environment for people from trauma to heal their past. It was both repetition compulsion, but also this opportunity to heal something and bring something to fruition that they hadn't been able to do before. They try to find situations that allow them to gain more control and sort of overcome those experiences to sort of become stronger. It's really common for say a, a child that was physically abused to grow up and then choose a spouse that's physically abusive. That happens because of repetition compulsion. So very similarly, founders who went through very tumultuous organizational systems and their families unconsciously seek out environments that are very intense and severe. So for the audience, uh, Cameron actually at one point was my coach also, and he helped me really fundamentally better understand. Um, a lot of the things that were going on at work were actually coming from my interpersonal dynamic sort of set up from my family system, like how I would actually react to conflict and, you know, really be averse to conflict. I, as an adult, really thought I had put all of those things behind me. And yet now I can really see how really critical moments in my career I didn't do the right thing. I, you know, it actually cost me dearly in a lot of ways to be not actually as aware as I needed to be at that moment. This is addressable, right? Like yeah. if you are aware, if you're conscious, if you're mindful and you have help like someone like Cameron, um, I found that that's really changed my life in just a very fundamental way. And if anything, I wish I figured that out when I was 22, not when I was 28, 29, 30. There would have been an entire decade of additional creation that I could have had if I figured it out earlier. So if you're that young, you can actually do this and skip all of the things that I had to learn the hard way. What I wasn't sharing with you at the time that I was working with you, partly because, you know, in the coach client relationship, it's not, it's not necessarily appropriate to, to open up too much about my own personal history. But the part of the reason that I was able to work with you is because I'd been through a lot of that similar stuff myself. I grew up with a father 
that was an alcoholic. He was a very successful businessman. He was an alcoholic and he was violent. Uh, I'll never forget one particular story in which I was out playing. I was actually out jogging. I was, I was about 13 and I was out jogging in our neighborhood and a, a, a very big aggressive dog, it was a Doberman Pinscher, ran out of this house and started chasing me. And it was super scary. I was able to get away from the dog. I ran home and I told my dad, he had been drinking at the time. He reached into his drawer. He grabbed a gun out of his drawer that was that he kept loaded. And he threw me in his car and we drove to that person's house and he had me pointed out and he banged on that door and accosted that dog owner uh, with, with a gun. And that was one of my most vivid memories as a child. Yeah. That's who my father was. And that was the environment that I lived in. I grew up in an environment where things, when there were problems, they got very, very severe, really fast and they were over the top. So in some ways, I too was wired to become a founder. He was a very successful business person. So I w grew up watching him make b business deals my whole life. And so I, I at once feared him, was terrified by him, but always wanted him to love me. And so becoming a business person was partly, I did it originally because I wanted to get his love, right? Yeah. And so. So I became a business person straight out of undergrad. I've, I've actually, uh, after post undergrad, I've, I've never had a job. I've only run businesses. And being an entrepreneur was driven by this relationship with my father, but also all of my trauma was driven by my father. And ultimately my becoming a therapist uh, was driven by him, which has brought those things together, those themes together, the world of psychology and the world of business. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm really thankful for that. You know, when did you start your own deep work? I think my experience is that there's always something to be working on. So I think that what really brought it all to a head for me was my first relationship with my with my first co-founder. So uh, we were running a successful e-commerce company during the first wave of the dot-com boom. And although we had a, a, a small but successful exit in 2005, my relationship with my co-founder was fraught with conflict and i was a, i was a, a big reason for that conflict it was i had a lot of anger i had a lot of uh, of aggression and it was all very unmetabolized uh, as because of you know all stemming from my 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 family of origin it was all very unmetabolized for me and i was i was kind of out of control with it i wasn't being the model leader that I thought I could be. So when we sold the company, I I decided to dive into therapy my own. I had already been in therapy, but I like really doubled down. And then I started uh, getting very focused and doubling down on my meditation practice. So I started going on a series of these week long, two week long, month long meditation retreats. I, I did several long deep therapy workshops, but then I had my own a weekly therapy. And I really think that that was the moment post 2005, post small acquisition experience that gave me the opportunity and the finances to be able to just completely focus on my psychology. So you could sort of go back and unpack things that had happened during the course of the last business relationships, you know, relationships with executives with you know, people you worked with, partners, your automatic responses to things had a deep effect. It was super important to go have the opportunity to not have to have a job and just focus on my own psychology and connect all of those dots from my childhood to my adult relationships, to my relationships with, you know, girlfriends and just really try to make sense and cultivate insight such that I could chart a new course for myself because yeah. it was very much needed at the time. Like I was really broken and I would not have been able to be the father I wanted to be. And I wouldn't have been able to be the leader and co-founder that I want to be the, the person I, I think I am today. I would not have been able to do that had I not taken that opportunity. 
Yeah, I hear that. I feel, you know, everything you just said, that feels like that's like played out in my life um, <laughs> in the same way. Though a lot of the people who are going to be listening to this, they won't have had an exit yet. And in fact, they will be us when we're sort of in the middle of our startups um, the first time we did it. The allegory I like to think of is everyone thinks of our, themselves as this sort of unified consciousness, but the more useful way to think about it is that you know, there's a horse and a rider almost. That time where you pause and you can meditate and do these retreats and sort of invest in yourself, that's like a very, almost the perfect way to uh, be very clear about who is the horse and who is the rider. It's really about understanding the horse better so that both of you can work, <laughs> yeah, work towards the same goal, right? Given that a lot of people don't have that time to take take time out like you know what would you recommend what can they do i think it's a really good question it was a it was a major privilege for me to have that opportunity to just completely focus on my psychology and i think that a lot of founders especially early stage don't have that luxury there's probably about 80 percent of what i did that they could still do now which is get weekly therapy and go start meditating and go on regular meditation retreats. Also get a coach. So oftentimes the company will pay for a coach. And especially if you're in the initialized portfolio, they'll always support that 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 sort of thing. Yeah. And and then going on meditation retreats, say you take a week every six months to go and sit for seven days, the return on that investment think about how good it's going to be for you, for your co-founder and for the business. And your investors are going to love it because you're going to be a better leader if you do those things. It's paid crazy dividends to me, you know, many times over at this point. So I really recommend people do inner work because the inner work allows you to actually radiate that outwards into your organization. Um, and it's real. The reason why you can really see it in organizations is that it's the same reason why people look at the CEO or the founders of a company and the culture of that company, how they make decisions, how they work together. It's actually the outgrowth of the personality of the founding team. Um, it's exactly that, right? And so if you can find ways to upgrade the founders real time, if you can find, you know, without swapping in different people, like literally taking the people who are there and helping them be more aware of themselves and aware of each other, if they can make better decisions, like, oh my God, how powerful is that? That'll radiate out into the org and people will actually be more effective by, you know, 10x. Yes, because positivity and, and mental health is positively infectious. It will affect other people and it affects business outcomes. So one other thing that I want to kind of get back to is uh, what we used to call in the, in, the, in the clinical world, bibliotherapy. And, and this is something you've done a lot of, Gary, is you've done a ton of research. Think of all the research and reading that you've done on your own mental health from all the way down to the brass tacks of how your how your brain functions around your neurobiology through the right the way the right brain and the ref, left brain work in relationships, uh, the impact of trauma on the brain. All of this is actually really important to to do all at the same time, the therapy, the coaching and the research because really diving into the source code of how your mind works will really help you make sense of the changes that you and the behaviors that you need to address. It's interesting that you say source code because I actually think about this as metaprogramming. So how does a mind reprogram itself to have better outcomes, right? Like I, I want to have better relationships with my coworkers and I want to be more effective at work. But not only that, I, I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better husband. There are definitely moments now where I can uh, sit there and watch. I mean, it's almost like the horse, right? <laughs> you have some sort of strong emotion, so, you know, you're stressed out and you snap at someone, right? And those are sort of the moments of the horse needed something here, right? It needed to be fed in some way or it needed to express itself in some way. And then that's like sort of the rider. The rider part is, oh, I need to be conscious of this. I need to actually know that this is happening so that then I can very explicitly make space for that. Next time that happens, I'll, I'll notice the signs that like lead me to that. And then I can take another path. I think that the people are actually really capable of changing themselves through the application of these things. In the neurological world, they have the same neurons that fire together, wire together. 
So when you're changing behaviors, first of all, it's hard to change behavior because you actually have to physically change the neuro, the neuro, your neurobiology and neurons that fire together uh, sequentially and in a pattern and often on a regular cadence get stronger and stronger and stronger. So it's physically hard to change behaviors because there's all this bandwidth dedicated to those old behaviors. So what you've done, Gary, is you've done a great job of understanding that source code and then physically doing the hard work. And it actually is yeah. like schlepping to change a behavior because you're moving against a physical system yeah. to practice something new. Oh, and then this is where coaching or therapy, having another person uh, actually allows that to happen. I think meditation is a very fundamental piece of it for sure, but I feel like I have not been able to get the sort of breakthroughs I get sitting with someone else. I mean, this is my experience. Like I've had crazy breakthroughs with you, with my therapist, with my torch coach today that I wouldn't be able to have just on my own. Even with unlimited literature and unlimited time to think, my mind would probably wander and I'd probably go someplace else. And there's something very powerful in sitting with someone, uh, going deep into a particular episode, a particular moment. For me, it's often you know, very strong emotions, right? Uh, especially around conflict. And a lot of this coming from my family of origin, right? I really, really <laughs> pretty conflict averse, but I've become a much better manager by being able to spot those strong emotions. And then now I have a bunch of different tools that I use to try to catch those moments. And, you know, sometimes it's, I need to take a moment and I, you know, I cannot, I shouldn't make a decision in the moment. Sometimes it's, I need to ask questions of the, of the other person so I can better understand where they're at. They're, they're just like all these little tools. I've gotten so much out of coaching, seriously. <laughs> you know, there's a, a true and lasting change. Behavior change happens primarily in the context of a very trusted and empathic relationship, right? So the, the research and the reading is part of it, but also the interpersonal nature of a coaching or therapeutic relationship is, is, is the other very essential piece, right? And that's what I think you're speaking to is you've got to have that mirror in the, in, in another person to really help you think through these, these changes. And, and in your case, uh, and, and in my case, I, I would like to believe is every time I've made a very big behavioral change that's led to a leadership change and laid, and positive business outcomes, it's started with a conversation with my coach or my therapist. I mean, to me, it's like uh, going to the gym, but instead of for your body, it's for your mind. So in terms of your coaching, um, I understand your coach is very eminent. Um, She's the author of Radical Candor, which is an incredible book. You know, I, I first read Radical Candor uh, by Kim Scott uh, a couple of years ago, and then I started using her curriculum in working with executive teams, and it was incredibly effective. She's, she's a business person. She's not a psychologist, but there's so much psychology in the content that it was really, really accessible for me. And then I just started tracking her, following her on Twitter, and then went through like three or four different intro attempts to try to get her on the phone with me. And then it, and then it happened. And I've been so thankful for the work that we've done. It's made a huge difference. What is Radical Candor? And then how has that sort of affected what you've been doing as a, as a leader and CEO? As a leader, the culture that I'm trying to create at Torch is I call it high empathy high accountability. What I mean by that is you have to be a high performer. The expectations are extremely high because we are, after all, a venture-backed startup that wants to be a very big company. So the accountability piece is really essential. But the empathy piece is the part that makes us human, that makes us capable of understanding the interpersonal and the inner world of our employees and our coworkers. If you look at Kim Scott's work, it's actually similar. She has a framework for radical candor. Kim Scott's X axis is challenging directly and Kim Scott's Y axis is caring deeply. In the upper right quad, you have radical candor, which is this perfect combination of challenging directly and caring deeply. And then in the lower right quad, where you have low empathy, but high challenge, you have obnoxious aggression, right? Yeah. Which, you know, leaders who are assholes, to paraphrase, okay? Lovely. And then in the upper left, 
you have high empathy founders who don't challenge directly, right? And she, totally. right? So by so default, then, that's me. <laughs> by default, that's for sure me. <laughs> right? So there's there's a lot of psychology built into that very simple totally. framework, which made it really um, perfect for, for me. One of the things that I think was one of the big breakthroughs in coaching with you, I very distinctly remember you saying, hey, Gary, what do you think is the most optimal organization? Is it high love, high structure, or is it high love, low structure? You didn't even ask about the low love part because, you know, you knew me. So I'm like, I grew up in, you know, comparatively a low love, high structure environment. In adulthood, I found that I was uh, looking for exactly the opposite of that. And what was right for me is actually totally wrong for pretty much everyone else, is, <laughs> is what you helped me realize. You understood your psychology enough to, to start to adapt. Everyone starts from someplace, right? Like you started from this default of being very high love, low structure, but then that's your starting point for making change. Yeah. I mean, I actually think that I was so unaware of the difference, my own personal differences that I actually... And I think a lot of people still do this. A lot of people really assume that whatever your experience is, is actually the common and general experience. And if anything, spending more time in coaching, um, especially about interpersonal dynamic, is having a much deeper appreciation for neurodiversity, like all the different mm -hmm. other people out there, right? Like, you know, it's sort of two things. One is recognizing what is automatic for me, what is innate to me is not innate at all for other people. That's where management falls down a lot. Not having empathy really means believing that everyone else operates and thinks exactly in the same way I do. And that's mm -hmm. just definitely not true. The next step is how do you actually make space for it then? And how do you change it? How do you make it work for sure, right? Like we want diversity. We want people from all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of different experiences because uh, that's actually how you get a much better outcome. But um, it's hard, right? Like it's r really hard. It requires a leader who's extra conscious of a lot of these things. Changing gears a little bit, we're all sort of going through a lot with COVID-19. You know, your coaches are working with Fortune 1000, working with like sort of every type of organization. What should the listeners really be paying attention to as leaders in their organization? And COVID is mostly causing a tremendous amount of suffering for a lot of people. What that means to me is how do I galvanize the team? How do I invest in more in mental health? How do I improve my communications? And I think there's a few ways that we've done that really well. One is that we we adapted very quickly to remote work and adapted our communication uh, cycles and our communication strategies. Uh, two is that I became, have become more, even more transparent as a CEO. I have been really open with my employee base about things like churn, about economic uncertainty, around uh, about layoffs. I've been very open and not particularly guarded around that information. And the reason why I've done that is that, first of all, I believe that the worst thing you can have right now during a crisis is a team that doesn't trust the leadership. Yeah, because right. to me, like that's what is going to kill your company is if the team loses trust in the leadership. And the number one way that they're going to lose trust is if they believe that you're lying to them, that you're not telling the truth. I've been extra open around the hard stuff so that so that people know that they can trust me. That way, when I do have to have a hard conversation or if I do have to lay people off, I have done so in integrity with them. So I would say that's the maybe the unusual thing that I'm doing that I feel particularly focused on and proud of. That's really powerful. I mean, everyone's in it together. The empathetic thing is to actually include people and be super upfront with them. And then the, the one thing that I think is um, really interesting and I think we're seeing increasingly is if you show great gratitude, then the team will show great gratitude to you as well. And the team actually gets bound together uh, much more tightly through this, this sort of thing. There's a lot of talk out there about what it means to be a wartime leader after the book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. But what I think that's not talked about in terms of what it's, what being a wartime leader is about, yes, you do have to be more decisive Yes, you have to make stronger and quicker decisions, but at the same time, you also have to up your empathy game and up your compassionate game and up your transparency game. Those things are not mutually exclusive. 
you can be a more decisive leader, you can be a, a high accountability leader and be compassionate and empathetic and honest all at the same time. And to me, that's the that's the special thing about this whole opportunity is I think it pushes us into being our best selves. Cameron, one of the really difficult decisions that turned out to be great was the acquisition of Everwise, another startup that had built incredible enterprise base. And we built Torch thus far to be very focused on startups. And now we're sort of in the middle of actually a relatively difficult time for startups. So I think that a lot of founders have that one thing that they did that they're really, really glad they did before COVID. Yeah. And for us, that was this merger with Everwise. I didn't know in Q4 of last year, I didn't know how big of a deal it was going to be for us, but it was really tremendous. And it was a hard decision because most of the advice I got was not to merge, not to acquire. And, and the reason is because when startups merge with other startups, it usually kills the startup. But for us, it was absolutely the right thing to do because it allowed us to move up market into enterprise and balance out our customer portfolio with all the startups that we were working with. And where we have seen churn this year, we've seen it more on the startup side and we've actually seen stability and even growth on the enterprise side. Yeah. Had I not done a lot of work on myself, I would have felt too insecure to make that decision when I was getting a, a lot of advice not to do it. Yeah. Right. And that's that, that's one really important reason why I think founders do need to get therapy and get coaching is because you're not going to be able to make unpopular decisions. You're not going to be able to tolerate people not liking you. You have to be able to tolerate those things to to make the decisions that are right for your company. Left to the most automatic response, you might not do the right thing. And so yeah. it requires a lot more consideration. I mean, honestly, that's what I often also use my coaching sessions to do. W one thing that um, some people talk to me about is, uh, Gary, why do you have a coach and a therapist? Like, don't you have friends? And the reality is like, yeah, I have friends. I really like my friends. The amount of help that sometimes I need is it exceeds that of what I would feel comfortable asking my friends to do, right? This is actually even like the things that uh, my wife is incredibly supportive, really good listener, um, really helpful. And I still rely on her for a lot. There's still something to be said for someone who professionally that, you know, they are here to help you make the right decision for you, right? Yeah. And that that's actually a, a very big deal. Because even if you speak to executives on your team or your investors or trusted advisors, they're still going to come at it from, you know, certainly their own experience. And then the coaching experience is much more about asking questions for you to figure it out yourself. And that's a very different kind of interaction. Yeah. I mean, I choose my friends for, you know, uh, different reasons than I would choose my coach or my therapist. And yeah, they're that's very right. different, right? I, my, my, my friends are my friends. They're not experts on my psychology and I don't actually want them to be. Yeah, that's right. It's a totally different thing. So yeah. there are so many levels to this. One of the things that I've been really excited about, one of your new new initiatives is this idea of group coaching. So being able to take sort of Stanford T group style interaction and basically allow that to happen remotely uh, facilitated through Torch. So Torch's group sessions. You were a T group facilitator for Stanford previously, and that's such, I haven't been through it myself, but I've heard amazing things. The work that I've done in T groups and the training that I got at Stanford to facilitate T groups is some of the most meaningful work that I've ever done. And it translates so directly into running an executive team. And it also translates really well into working with coworkers. And so we've been trying to think of different ways to iterate on that format and recreate this experience within Torque. What it would look like is an opportunity with an expert facilitator to get together with peers in a very structured format and talk through leadership challenges in this group context. I'm in a group myself. I get something different from my group that I get from my own personal coaching and from my own therapy. If I were to say there were three legs of the stool for me in terms of my own personal development, it would be group work, meditation, and coaching slash therapy, individual coaching. Those are the three legs of the stool. So at some point, if you haven't already, 
you're you're going to have to do group work. It's just it's advanced work and it's super rich and meaningful. Everyone's going through something, and then the most powerful thing is to realize that you're not alone. You yeah. are not alone. There are moments where you're facing some sort of crisis or some sort of problem that as a CEO or as a founder, sometimes you feel like you're like on a desert island. You yeah. are on a distant planet completely alone. Yeah. And these things allow you to realize you're not. These are things that you can get help with, that there are ways out. There are things that actually just require a short conversation with someone yeah. who cares about you. It's almost like chiropractor, right? It's like yes. a minor an adjustment can be so powerful and it can lead you to a much better place. So. Yeah, but instead of one chiropractor, imagine you're in a group of eight other chiropractors that can all help you. <laughs> yeah, awesome. that's right. It's powerful, man. Cameron, thanks a lot for this. Honestly, I really appreciate you and the things that you've um, done for me. And I'm really, I'm also really appreciative of being an investor in Torch um, sure. because I see the work that you've done for our portfolio companies and companies, mm -hmm. you know, all the way across the ecosystem. I think it's really special. Thank you, man. Thank you so much, Gary. It was great to see you. Thank you.